Hi, good morning all. Thank you for being here today. First, I would like to acknowledge Michael Specht, the supervisor of the town of Ramapo, Ali Pinkasovitz, mayor of the village of Kayser, Brad Wydell, chief of Ramapo Police Department, Rabbi Hirsch Horowitz, Community Outreach Center, Steve Gold, co-president, Jewish Foundation and Foundation of Rockland County, and Dr. Francis Pratt, president of NIAC and WACP. Thank you. And welcome back, Governor Cuomo. Good to be back. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Governor Cuomo, I, I have some, I'm going to put everything away, because yeah. I'm going to talk from my heart. Okay. I think you're a living example of true leadership. Sunday morning, 6.03, you woke me because you didn't go to sleep after that horrific, terrible, terrible stabbing what happened there. I didn't forgive you yet, but uh, <laughs> and let me tell you, since then, you have not rested. True leadership, going out, meeting community leaders, hearing the concerns, and putting a plan into action. And we already see the state troopers all over the place protecting us, so on and so forth. Governor. You built a bridge called Mario, Governor Mario Como Bridge. That bridge is meant to connect Rockland to Westchester. I want to let you know, since you came that morning, you are building bridges in the county, okay? By being here, being an example, taking a lead, showing leadership, we are privileged now that your bridges are being built to connect Rockland to Rockland. We have now coalitions building, unity building, and hopefully it's, it's, it's a turn to a new era. At the same time, Governor, we really appreciate that, as I said, you put a plan into action. You're here today to announce funding to protect the religious institutions. And as they say, an ounce of prevention is a thousand pounds of cure. By concluding, I'd like to publicly give over a message from the Grand Rabbi Tversky of New Square, who's overseas, the secretary called me this morning. He's thanking and acknowledging the governor for his preparedness and always being a leader, a true leader with actions, whatever is necessary. Thank you. And now my pleasure, I want to introduce to you, Governor Andrew Como. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. First to uh, Mayor Spitzer, uh, he talks about leadership. He, he should know. If he wants to see leadership, he should look in the mirror because that's where leadership exists. Uh, you often see what a leader is, is made of at a time of crisis and how people respond. Uh, and Mayor Spitzer has been a rock for the community. He's uh, been comforting and calm, but he's also been a strong advocate for the community. Uh, and I have such respect for him. Let's give Mayor Spitzer a round of applause. <laughs> we have Rabbi Rottenberg here. Uh, we are all very sorry for the pain that he has felt, but I have to tell you, he came and spoke at the State of the State, uh, speaking to the whole legislature about uh, what happened, and he was such an inspiration. And again, no anger, no retribution. Uh, he truly inspired the entire congregation. So let's thank Rabbi Rottenberg for everything he's done and for everything he's been through. <laughs> Joseph Gluck, who is the hero who thwarted the assailant, and we recognized him at the State of the State. He deserves a round of applause. We have with us from my team, uh, Robert Mejica, who is the budget director. We have Michael Copey, the director of uh, New York State Emergency Management. We have Kevin Bruin, who you'll hear from in a moment, who's the first deputy superintendent of the New York State Police. And we have uh, Joe Petr Tripodo. It's an Italian name. I shouldn't have a problem with that. Uh, Colonel, New York State Police. I'm going to put this away uh, also, uh, as the mayor did. Uh, because this is a message that is easy because it comes from the heart. Uh, we still grieve what happened in Muncie. Uh, the entire state grieves. They're shocked, surprised, uh, repulsed by what happened in Muncie. 
But the situation is actually worse than just what happened in Muncie. Muncie was not an isolated incident. It was the most egregious, the most violent, uh, the most damaging. But we had seen uh, scores of anti-Semitic activity all throughout this state, uh, as recent as this past weekend. We've seen acts of violence and anti-Semitic activity all across this nation. Uh, we were observers for a long time and wanted to believe that that couldn't happen here, right? What happened in Pittsburgh couldn't happen in New York. What happened in California couldn't happen in New York until it happened in New York. And I refer to it as a cancer, an American cancer that is spreading through the body politic. And it's a cancer because one cell in the body attacks other cells in the body. And once this country gets to a place where it starts to demonize by religion or race, well, then we have lost who we are, right? This is a nation founded on religious freedom. George Washington, George Washington went to a synagogue, worshiped with the congregation, sent a letter afterwards saying essentially what this nation is about is freedom of religion and everyone having the right to pray to their own God and being safe in that practice. So, hence, having lost the soul of the nation. It is ignorant. It is intolerant. It's also illegal. And while we pray for solidarity, we march for solidarity, uh, we gather together for solidarity, government has an additional obligation, which is the obligation to act. Uh, government officials are not in the prayer business. They can join in, but they are in the business of acting. And the number one responsibility of government is to keep people safe. That is the first responsibility to protect the public. Uh, so I pledged when I was here last time that the state government would take action, and dramatic action and action on all fronts. And we announced a program in the state of the state that does that, and we're going to follow up today to address a specific request that was made the last time I was in this room in response to Muncie. Uh, statewide, what we're going to be doing is to combat the ignorance. I want to see every New York State public school teach our young people, our children, about diversity and racial tolerance and what it means to be an American and what this nation was really founded on. I want a cultural awareness specifically about the Jewish community. And I want to expand the Holocaust Museum that we have in New York City, which is a great facility. And I want to see school children going through that Holocaust Museum as part of their education. Understand what happened to the Jewish community. Understand the relationship between the Jewish community and New York State. And understand that New York would not be New York without the Jewish community. We're organizing faith leaders all across the state because whether it is Judaism or Christianity or Hinduism, every religion has the same basic concept that the strongest four-letter word is love and not hate, and it is about tolerance. So leadership from our faith community and more security uh, because that is the fundamental obligation. And we want more funding for more state police in the hate crimes unit. Uh, I want a domestic terrorism law that prosecutes what we saw in Muncie as what it was, which was a form of terrorism. When you attack a large number of people based on their religion, based on their race, you are a terrorist. Terrorist doesn't have to come in on a plane. Terrorist doesn't have to be some foreign cell. You can have a terrorist who is American-born. And that's what domestic terrorism speaks to. And we want to pass that law. Uh, and we want to provide more funding 
for schools, religious organizations, to put in security measures. We have great new technology that can go a long way. And when I was here, Mayor Spitzer talked about license plate readers, which is a fantastic piece of technology. That is actually how we caught the Muncie assailant. We had a human license plate reader, Joseph Gluck, who actually got the license plate uh, after the attack, but then an electronic license plate reader found that plate on that car going over the George Washington Bridge. License plate readers mean you can see everyone coming in to the community and everyone going out. You have the time, you have the license plate, and then we have license plate readers all around the state on highways, tunnels, bridges, et cetera. Uh, so if anybody thinks about attacking the community, they better think again because we will know, we will find out, uh, and we will prosecute you to the fullest extent of the law. Mayor Spitzer said he wanted more license plate readers. I said, can't we just get 100 Joseph Glucks and put them on all the corners? He said, no, no, we need an electronic system. Uh, so today it's my pleasure to announce $340,000 to install those license plate readers all throughout the community. Uh, as a safety device. <laughs> and this is just the beginning. We're going to implement the agenda that I laid out in the state of the state. Uh, I want everyone to know that we have learned from Muncie a painful lesson. We've learned from what's going on, and we will respond, and we will react, uh, and we will do everything in our power on every level to make sure this horrific act doesn't happen again. With that, let me turn it over to the first deputy of the state police, uh, Kevin Bruin. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. Just some further background on license plate readers. As the governor has said, license plate readers can help uh, keep our communities safe and fight against these disturbing acts of hate. Automatic license plate readers, or LPRs as they're commonly known, are high-speed computerized cameras that can be mounted on light po uh, telephone poles, street lights, highway overpasses, in mobile trailers, or on the backs of police cars. License plate readers function by capturing all license plate numbers that come into view, along with the location, date, and time. That data, which includes a photograph of the vehicle, is then uploaded to a central server and relayed and shared among police agencies. And as the governor has said, one example of how critical this technology can be is that a license plate reader mounted on the George Washington Bridge uh, helped track the Muncie attacker, attacker and ultimately leading to his arrest. So this funding will install the license plate readers in New Square and in Muncie. It will not only hap, ha, uh, help us capture criminals, it will also help us deter folks from committing these acts in the first place. And now it's my honor to introduce uh, the brave man who risked his life not only to um, stop the Muncie attacker, but also, as the governor said, memorize the uh, license plate uh, number and all that chaos, Joseph Cluck. Good morning, governor. Good morning, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming back to our community this morning and for your unwavering support always. When our community was attacked earlier this month, Governor Como was here in less than 10 hours uh, to stand arm in arm with us through our worst nightmares. He demonstrated that true leadership demands action, not just words. By memorizing the license plate number, I was able, with God's help, nothing me, it was only God that helped me, made me go find it, to help the police track down the attacker by the cameras on the bridge. But this would not have been possible. Without the, camp, without the license plate readers on the bridge, nobody would have, uh, wouldn't have helped nothing. I'm grateful to the governor for his continued support to our community, expecting this uh, expanding these technologies in our community, and hopefully will prevent uh, future attacks from us for forever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you to all who are here. We'll take any on-topic questions. I'll then take off-topic questions. So. Uh, 
the, my colleagues can get on with their day. Any questions for myself, for Mayor Spitzer, anyone who's here? Yeah, the, the bail reform issue, uh, I'm very proud of what we did last year because the, the bail system was inherently unjust. Uh, the bail system said, the bail system was dependent on wealth, not merit, not risk of flight. It was all about wealth. If you could make bail, you'd stay out of jail. If you can't make bail, you would uh, be in jail. So uh, it shouldn't be about how rich you are, right? The justice system is supposed to be blind to wealth. Uh, so we made significant reforms. Uh, they just went into effect officially January 1, as you know. Uh, we are now looking at uh, the effect of those changes and considering other changes. Uh, it's a complicated system. You make one change in one part of the system, it has ramifications in other parts of the system. Uh, so that's what we're evaluating now, and uh, we, are ha we have an open discussion, uh, and uh, we're speaking to all sorts of engaged and informed sources, and over the next few weeks, uh, we'll be having the conversation with the legislature as to uh, what adjustments do we want to make. Short answer is yes. We made $45 million additional available. Uh, I'm going to have a proposal in our state budget. The budget director is here, Robert Mejica, for additional security funds. And license plate readers are a way to harden uh, the, the security. They are the highest tech that we have. Uh, the license plate readers, as you heard from the first deputy, you can put them basically anywhere. Uh, and they capture every vehicle, every license plate coming down that road. They can run it against a database uh, and then have an alert if that plate triggers an alert. Uh, so it's one of the best uh, technological answers that we have, and we're moving ahead to put it in, in, uh, in this community. You want to speak to that, Ken? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure of the numbers of license plate readers, and the community and the Ramapo police will put them in the locations that they think is most appropriate, and they will share them with the state police. And that can be further shared with other law enforcement agencies. Well, you hope that the knowledge that the, this kind of technology is in place makes them think about not doing it and going somewhere else or not doing it at all. But there are other things. For example, if someone is engaging these acts on a lower level and is wanted for um, hateful activity, racist graffiti, that sort of thing, and there's an arrest warrant out for them, that triggering of the LPR can result in them immediately being arrested, which would prevent an act. It's sometimes hard to, to show how something didn't happen, but that's the way it would be prevented. So it's also a deterrent. It's a deterrent and, in fact, could result in somebody being arrested on a more minor offense when they had something more dramatic planned. Thank you. Yeah, just to expand on, on uh, the first step's point, you first pick the locations that you think are strategic as entrances to a community in this uh, instance or exits from a community. Uh, the license plate readers, as I said, uh, you often won't see the license plate reader. But uh, people will know that community has license plate readers. Uh, the license plate reader picks the plate and within seconds, literally, runs the plate uh, and the registered owner of that vehicle and you can find out a lot of information that is uh, on police files. They'll contact those police files. will go through the local police. They'll go to the state police. 
Uh, so it's a very elaborate database that you run that plate against. And a person can have outstanding warrants, which often show up. There can be previous arrests. There can be, uh, they can be a fugitive. All that will come from uh, the license plate reader. And it is almost instantaneous. Uh, and then you can track that plate to other locations, which is exactly what happened at Muncie, right? The next license plate reader happened to be at the George Washington Bridge. But if the person had gone to a different route, they would have uh, ultimately hit another license plate reader also. Well, look, it's a balance, right? Uh, people want uh, privacy. I understand that. But people also want safety. And you look at the community in Muncie, uh, I have no problem saying that the balance has tilted and this is a community that needs to be safe. We know this is a community that is under attack. Uh, we know that it is a continuing attack. Uh, and in this case, public safety outweighs an individual's right to privacy, in my opinion. On the same note, what about the role of and by the way, privacy. It reads your license plate. You don't have a heck of a lot of privacy in your license plate. It's on the front of your car. I can go see your license plate anytime I want and record your license plate. So it's not like I'm looking in your wallet or your pocket, right? You have a license plate on the front of your car. People will read it. You should expect people will read it. What about the role of social media? That's been answered that a lot here by Look, hate communicates a number of ways. Uh, and hate can communicate with anonymity uh, on the internet in a way that it never could before. It's anonymous, and it can be irresponsible, uh, and it can be pervasive. There is no doubt. One makes more, the situation more complicated. One more on topic. Yes, uh, Governor, aside from the security measures, is there are more funding intended for mental health treatment? The person who was accused in the Poche Road attack, his attorney says he has history of mental illness. Is there that component being? Considered? Yes, yes. The budget will have a robust investment in mental health also. What is your analogy uh, to this situation? That you have to, to you have to think out of the box, and money doesn't resolve all the things. You have to think doctrine. You have to think security to fight against terrorism. Well, we are we're doing uh, we're attacking this on multiple levels, right? Education, literally changing the curriculum in schools. Uh, cultural, understanding different cultures, expanding a Holocaust museum so every child can go through the Holocaust museum, getting all faith leaders from all religions uh, to preach what is true, that this is ugly and this is hate and it is intolerant and it is violative of almost every uh, religious doctrine. Uh, and then from a security point of view, Israel has uh, probably the most advanced security uh, on the globe, right? It's just, it's amazing what Israel has done. But that has uh, grown over decades of having been targeted and having neighbors to the left and to the right. Uh, so you feel surrounded and, and you had to develop that security. This is a relatively new experience in this country. Uh, I can't think in my lifetime of uh, anything this ugly and uh, anything this pernicious and anything this widespread. We've had isolated incidents over time, but they flared up and then it went away. Uh, we're seeing something in this country we've never seen before. Uh, so yes, more security and then balancing the security with the right to privacy, which is also a balance this nation has to work out 
again, without the experience that Israel has, right? Uh, you walk through Jerusalem, you're on a camera almost anywhere in Jerusalem at any given time. Uh, the technology is just amazing. Uh, this country is not there yet in terms of that kind of sacrifice of privacy for public safety, hence the question from one of your colleagues. But we are very serious about increasing security. Nothing like this has ever been done before. So this is the most aggressive approach that we have taken in terms of security, and I'm proud of it. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you all very much, thank you.